Thank you, Eddie. Uh, plenty on data there, and I suspect the data is going to form a, a pretty major part of what we're going to be hear, hearing next. Our third lightning speaker is Lucy Knight. Uh, Lucy is co-founder of the Open Data Institute, Devon, uh, Open Data Lead and Policy Strategy Officer at Devon County Council. Lucy. Hey, thank you. All right, I need a moment to gather my wits because Eddie just nicked all my best lines. Um, <laughs> so bear with me, and forgive me if I keep looking down at my cards, because if I don't, I'll go off at a tangent, and believe me, nobody needs that today. So, um, so uh, that was my introduction. I'm Lucy Knight. I'm primarily I'm from Devon County Council, and I'm on the policy and performance side. So I've just heard some extremely uh, intelligent, and well thought out, very technical discussions. Most of it went like, Phew. so um, that's not what you're going to get from me. You're going to get some arm waving. You're going to get some pictures, hand drawn slides, no expense spared, uh, and you're going to get mostly words of one syllable because that's what I do. I do. Um, I sit on what we call the Geek Wonk interface. I can talk um, tech a bit and I can take that back and I can go and talk to the policy people and I can talk that mostly and take it back to the tech people and I translate from side to side. Now the reason I've ended up with open data is it's because one of those things that we're not totally sure where it belongs or where it should live. It probably shouldn't live in ICT but nevertheless we do need some, some support and some expertise from IT departments. Um, and the fact that it's in this section, information sharing and so on and so forth, it's, it's very applicable, not just as Eddie was saying, because we need to consume our own data and to get better, and, and that would be our business intelligence, and we need to know what we have and what it's telling us, but also, uh, and this is the thing that uh, I'm mainly going to talk about, is, is about the access to things that we're going to need, despite what the corporate network and the corporate security setup says, there are going to be people who are tinkering and playing with stuff that you need to be aware of. And I bet when you got up this morning, you were looking forward to the conference and you were thinking, the one thing that would make today complete would be to go home with something new to worry about. Well, that's what I'm going to give you, so sorry. Right, you, I, I've showed this to a few audiences, but you're probably the first audience where most people already know what this is, the old hype cycle. Um, it's usually a tech thing. I'm showing it to people in the context of open data. There's so much hype around open data. It's going to fix everything. It's going to solve all our problems. Everything's going to be wonderful. The trees are going to bloom again. Beer will be a penny a pint. There's billions and billions of dollars in the economy. Efficiency savings, all of this. And I think that we've done the peak, possibly. We're sliding back down now because people are saying, oh, open data, yes, I've heard of that. I don't actually see a use for it. What's all that about? And where I've got the, the we are here spot, I was showing this to um, Dem leadership and just saying, I think that's where we are. And before we get completely disillusioned, I just want to um, introduce a, a new point on the cycle, which I'm going to call the hobnail boot of pragmatism. There's a kick up the backside that says, let's just get on with it. Let's build some stuff. Let's build some stuff and see what happens. So that's, that's my view on that one. And because we have to get, before we get completely down in the dumps, we have to start thinking about, we've got to get competent with this. We've actually got to look at not just what we want to do with it, but actually how does that work in the, in the context of what the whole organization's got to do. Um, and we've got to be good with data. And again, Eddie stole all my best lines around this. We've got to get good at working out not just how we manage our data, but what we want it to do for us, because that will help us to design the things we want from it. And then and that's about you know, making sure people get the benefits from the data that we've got. So there's a lot of different approaches. And I'm part of the, the group that was recognized recently by Francis Maud for you know, the Open Data Champions, the 16 councils who are getting some work done around this. And most of my um, peers on that group are in councils that have got a, a data store. It's absolutely lovely. They've got a lot of information going in, and it's coming in from different partners. So they've got some excellent sort of place-based um, data and intelligence coming out of that, and it comes out in different ways. You know, they're just simple dashboards and numbers, some performance gauges, um, some more complex internal um, sort of metrics, or just simply as open data, people can go grab it as CSV, JSON, whatever they like. But Devon is taking a slightly different approach. We've tinkered a bit with the data store. We, we spun up a CCAN instance to see what we can do with it. But we have found that what we've actually got is more um, small sort of iterations. Let's try something. Um, it's almost certainly going to fail. And if that's going to fail, then let's, let's fail small, fast, and cheap. So less of an impact. We can basically sweep it under the rug and move on, do the next thing, take the learning, and move on. So a lot of the stuff is happening under the corporate radar. 
um, it's happening in all pockets around the organisation. And because it's not consuming any large amounts of resource, instead of having to create business case and say this is the thing that we're doing and you should support it because, actually we're going more with, with basically an agile user story. This person needs this thing so that they can get this job done. And that's quite helpful. But where it's unhelpful is it means that we frequently find we're clashing with what corporate needs and specifically with what ICT needs. It does not fit with, um, with your needs, which is you know, a secure, well-managed network. Because we're tinkering, we're playing, we're playing with stuff that you're probably aware of. I wouldn't dream that anybody would want to use within a, um, a work context. So um, I, for one, am playing around with stuff like Google Charts. I've got colleagues who are using Google Drive, using WordPress. They're playing with a bit of PHP. They are using, um, we've got some life race stuff going on. Um, we've got people who need things like Open Refine. Uh, that's not part of the corporate desktop. So we've got all these things that are happening and people are coming up with this stuff and that's wonderful because it probably isn't going to go anywhere except it might. And if it does, and for instance, if these people pop up and they show it to a councillor or to the chief exec and those people go, oh, this is great, we need this, this is wonderful, we definitely want this as a corporate offer and every chair in the room swivels to look at the ICT rep and say, you can build that, right? It's where it becomes your problem, or not. It shouldn't be your problem, but people will be looking at you and saying, is that something that we can actually do? So these people, they're in your organization. They're people like me. I'm really sorry, we're, we're annoying. We keep popping up and saying we've got a better way of doing stuff. We don't understand the technology. This is why we're a problem. We are um, on the policy side, we're in FOI teams maybe, democratic support maybe. We're talking to end users who are saying, I need data to help me do this. And we don't understand all the tech. Um, now you might be lucky, all these people might be concentrated in one place. You might have an innovation lab or a skunk works, you might have something, you know, some achingly hip uh, purpose design space like Shift Surrey had, absolutely lovely, you visited their jam room, that's the Devon offer, we've just got a repurposed meeting room. But you may find you've actually got people sitting in all sorts of places, you know, some smart person in an analytics team who can code a bit is pulling something together and showing it to their manager, who's showing it to their manager, who's showing it to their manager. And these things will eventually rise to the point where somebody turns and looks at you and says, we want this, can we do this? So this, this is where I think there's a problem, there's a disconnect. People like me, we're not talking to ICT and we should be because we don't want to be an annoyance. We want to be friends with ICT really quite badly. We want to, um, to be able to have those conversations where we say, this is what I'm building, this is what it's for, this is who it's for, this is what it does, and I need access to Open Refine. I need access to, we need a corporate um, purchase of Google Drive, that sort of thing. Um, and for somebody who knows what they're talking about to say, yes, we can do that, or no, we can't do that, but here's your options. So we need to be having those conversations. Now, this shouldn't be your problem. You shouldn't have to go out searching for awkward people and say, you know, we should be talking. They should be coming to find you. But I suspect that they've got quite a way down the road before that occurs to them. So I'm afraid I don't have an answer there. I think that it should be possible for them to come talk to you. They may not realize that they need to. And I think that I just wanted to plant it in everybody's minds that be aware they are out there, just because they're not visible yet. They're definitely doing stuff like this and will at some point pop up and say, oh yeah, I'd run, I run this thing up in WordPress and I'd really like to make it a corporate thing and put it on the server and the internal server. Oh, and by the way, it needs to talk to this thing outside. You see, you can see I can't do the tech talk. And somebody in ICT is going to have to be aware of that and say, yeah, you can't do it that way. You're going to have to do it this way, please. And it all comes back to, and again, Eddie had all the best lines again, but it is about somebody in the organisation is going to look at that offer and say, yes, we do want that. And it will become your problem to sort out how that's possible within uh, your security constraints, your, your corporate standardised offer. And I think that's about it, actually. That's, that's where I was going to end. Are you aware where those people are, what they're doing, and are you aware of how you will deal with those issues and those questions when they come up, do you know what you can help them out with and do you have a solution in place for that? And that's it. Oops.
thank you for our lightning speakers for speaking at lightning pace they have managed to get in uh, within the within the time to give us an opportunity to take one or two questions from the audience um, if you want to pose a question to an individual or put, put a question to the whole panel that's fine um, any volunteers for uh, following up on some of the issues that have raised, I'm sure, particularly around, you know, both Philip's challenge to uh, socket Tim to um, uh, take a lead around broadband issues, I'm sure open data is something many of you are facing as well. Be brave, whoever wants to be the first person to put their hand up. Come on, you know you want to, be brave. Surely somebody in this room. Yeah. There we go, thank you very much. So wait for the mic coming, coming along. Thank you. Um, it, my, f my question really was for Verizon about identity. Um, we, we talked about the, the, the two factors of uh, what you know and what you own, but, but we didn't mention the, the what you are. And I just wondered how far away are we from biometrics to, to identify the individual? Because I, I, sometimes I forget my tokens, sometimes I haven't got my phone, but I've always got my fingerprints. Okay. Um, I don't know if Ali is still here. Verizon is actually on this panel, that was on the previous bit. I don't know if Ali is still here. If you yeah. want to just, just pick that up quickly. Yeah, uh, hi. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, we, we do that as well. We have what you are. Um, that's the th third factor of authentication. We're looking at all sorts of biometrics and we implement that uh, for different government agencies. Certainly, we implement that in the US. So, that, that's certainly another factor. I can take it offline and, and talk in more detail if you want. Okay, thanks, guys. Um, any questions then for, the, for, for the, the, the three most recent speakers? Have you got one over there? Great, thank you. Apologies, I was looking to the left. Thank you. I uh, just wanted to join together Eddie's talk and Lucy's talk. So Eddie was talking about open data across multiple local authorities and Lucy working in Devon Council, <coughs> County Council, which actually I think joins together a couple of local authorities as well. It's so wondering how those two things overlap and experiences from there. Sorry, Pitsy, your question was... What, um, uh, any experiences? So you're talking, you were talking about data across multiple local authority boundaries, mm -hmm. and how from the outside you want to be able to draw that across. Well, I think with... And Lucy from within Devon. Well, I think so. That the point I was trying to make is that certainly if we're trying to engage the, the app developer community, it's great if we can have just a larger scale. And you see cities like Leeds, I know, doing this incredibly well with Leeds and Data Mill. Um, I think there are other cities as well where you're getting progress. Um, what I did see certainly when I started writing my report that was that a lot of local authorities wanted to have that control with their own data portal. And we've got a hodgepodge right now, as you'll know, with sort of data.gov.uk, um, London, I think local authorities again trying to do a bit more uh, collectively I just like to see a little bit more thinking about are there better ways that we can join up that data come up with some common standards to make it as easy as possible for a viable business model um, in terms of more specifics would you like to come in on yeah. Yeah. Um, I think Devon's probably got the same thing going on as most councils if we talk about a data store we are talking about just data that relates to what's within our own um, boundary um, but we are a two-tier authority, so of course we've got uh, eight districts. Um, and for me, it would, mean, it, excuse me, it would be immensely valuable to get all districts um, talking to us as well, because a lot of the data that people are wanting is, is at that level. It is, it is parks and, and toilets and um, <sighs> planning at that level, um, environmental health and that sort of thing. So those are the requests we tend to get. In terms of, of trying to join up outside, I think that would be fascinating. I think that would be great to to approach even just our nearest geographic neighbours and just say to New Somerset, Dorset, Cornwall, um, and and even we could just get like a southwest thing going on. But really, to be of of true value, if you want an app that um, is going to be a major seller, you are talking about national data. And, and my personal preference would be to say to step back from that and say, this is not a job for any one council to try and fix this. This is a job for something like the LGA who've got their their LGA Inform tool and to say, actually, can we just give everything to you? And you sort that in the same way that you currently do with the benchmarking performance information that we give. Um, because they've already got that, that mechanism, that infrastructure, that tool set up. I don't think this is something that individual councils should be trying to create. I think we should just step back and say, someone, if we, if we all agree to put our data in the same place in the same standard format, then someone else can put that together and make some use of it. 
Actually, if I could just give one example, sorry, that has just occurred to me. Um, some of you, live, certainly those who are living in London, may be familiar with Appy Parking, um, where there was a guy called, I think it was Dan Huppert, who'd gone round trying to join up, um, take all the parking data, all the parking regulations from every single London borough, and created a brilliant app which was really popular. But he relied on local authorities, London boroughs, giving him that data. Um, halfway through this process, he was looking for investment and then suddenly called me because I'd interviewed him about something unrelated before and said, help, some of the London boroughs are now saying that they want to create their own parking app just for their borough and now won't give me their data. You had a guy there who was building something on a London scale, on a city scale, something that was genuinely useful at his own financial risk and his entire business model was being undone because a local authority wanted to do it for one borough and people frankly do not live and work and live out their lives in one local authority area. Um, I put him on to Heather Savory at the Open Data User Group, she bashed some heads together and thankfully he's now a tremendous success story. But that is an example of where we've got to get the scale and make sure we don't have missing pieces of the jigsaw. Could I pick up on that? Because I talked about collaboration in the context uh, of broadband and pulling through there. But the issues of collaboration apply across all cooperation in local government. And uh, the, 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 the core thing, and one of the things on the case studies of success in local government, is a wonderful phrase that progress begins after the ego has landed. Uh, everybody talks about leadership, the Führer Prinkip. In local government, we've got far too many egos and far too many leaders and far too many things collapse because you try to get everybody together. The core to success on collaboration appears to be getting small groups that <coughs> achieve critical mass of those who actually want to cooperate. And when I'm talking about the dummy's guide to collaboration, I'm thinking in one context, but within Socketum, there are decades of experience of collaborations that worked and collaborations that failed and the critical success factors. And one of the critical success factors appears to be a project leader who's had a charisma bypass. They give the ego and the leadership roles to whoever wants them, provided those will, they work together and leave the team to get on with the job. Uh, hence my view that it's really critical to harvest the knowledge that is within Socketum on how to actually make collaborations work, because otherwise none of them succeed, and we're never going to actually get the 30% and more savings from collaboration that enable us to avoid cuts, building on Mark's comments earlier. Thank you, speakers. I'm afraid we have to wrap up the session there. Um